Hello, uh, my name is Darina. I am, a, as I said, a third year doctoral student at the School of Nursing here at Penn. Um, you know, can you just uh, hold that up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. That's good. We want to make um, sure we get you for posterity. Sure. Uh, so my first, in my first life, I was a musician. Um, I was a pianist, and so some of what I'm doing now is connected to my previous life. Um, I also am a nurse, and uh, being in practice for a little while, I noticed that those, I work mostly with older adults, um, I noticed that older adults who were engaged in music, especially in the late stage of Alzheimer's or any related dementias, had more, had a less of a barrier to communicate with others. So that sort of spurred my initial interest in this topic, and when I started reading about um, mainly music cognition literature, uh, I was lost, to be honest. So, you know, I, I, and music is something that is very hard to describe, is very hard to um, calculate, to quantify what it is, but it is a wide, worldwide phenomenon. Everybody knows music, everybody almost loves music. Um, so that's how I started at the SCAN program um, here at Penn, and I specifically wanted to learn more about how music affects older adults with um, Alzheimer's disease. So through the SCAN program, I learned about the Penn Memory Center and took courses through the SCAN program uh, with, um, regarding neurodegenerative diseases. So for my dissertation, I'm looking at whether older adults who are engaged in music-related activities, and it's a scale that measures both music, uh, emotional response to music, direct uh, involvement in music, and more of an uh, ability to discriminate rhythm and tempo changes in um, music, uh, whether older adults who are involved, or who have a higher you know, scores on that scale, um, have a lower uh, rate of functional decline in their everyday activities. Uh, so that's my dissertation. I'll be doing it at the Penn Memory Center, hopefully, and I'm specifically looking at older adults with mild cognitive impairment. And mild cognitive impairment, for those of you who don't know, it can be a precursor to um, dementia, not just Alzheimer's or any related dementia. Um, but some older adults do not convert to dementia, which is interesting. So that's why it's sort of a, a higher risk group. Um, but a very highly sought after group among researchers. And uh, just for that reason, for that particular reason. So, um, so that's why I started the SCAN program and uh, hopefully be guiding in a couple of years. So music is processed through a system that um, is not affected as much by MCI. Is, yes. is that part of the theoretical? Correct, so people who are in the late stages yeah. of dementia Music is one of the last music related um, music regions in the brain who are responsible for music perception and the last one to go. Okay. So uh, people who have, could no longer speak or uh, recognize family um, members um, can still sing um, and can still remember music when they were 15, can still sing to the tune of. So that's, yeah, that was sort of the... So was there some idea that, okay, you're um, getting people to use the system that still works and somehow that has... Sure, I, I think in my own work I'm looking at the earlier spectrum of okay. cognitive decline, but there are certainly others who are um, looking at that. I'll just mention as a, as a related clinical observation is that uh, classic bedside demonstration for a patient who's had a stroke and now has expressive aphasia. So they have trouble speaking, their words are effortful, they can't string together a grammatical sentence. If you start singing happy birthday with them, they will catch right on <laughs> and produce a string of fluent happy birthday lyrics. And so for any well-learned, uh, overly represented song, you can you can start the song and they'll be able to sing right away. Absolutely, with it. yeah. I've seen it multiple times. Um, that's how melodic intonation therapy. Uh, there's currently an interventional study, a neuroimaging study looking at the neural correlates of MIT or melodic intonation therapy at Harvard, I believe. Um, and, you know, the whole idea is you start with melodic intonation therapy and then you slowly move into speech therapy, therefore, you know, because, I mean, people can sing, but a lot of people would feel, you know, I, I can always sing to my wife or something, you know, give me, you know, bread or something, right? So they want to speak, so eventually that melodic intonation turns into speech and then that's, that's, you know, the progression for stroke. Yeah.